Turn in your Bibles to Acts chapter 5, verse 29. Well, praise the Lord. Seems a little somber in here today. Maybe it's because we have so many people out of town and so much. We're going to have to wait this place up, amen? amen. Who's got a good joke for us? Y'all didn't hear about the boy that, uh, boy that wanted a new bicycle. So, I want you to forget the punchline. Here I go. Been praying for a new bicycle. You need a hundred dollars to get it. A couple weeks went by and nothing happened. So he decided to write God a letter. So he wrote a letter and he said, Lord, I, can I please have a hundred dollars to buy my new bicycle? When the post office saw it, they saw it was addressed to the Lord, they kind of thought to themselves, well, what are we going to do? We don't want to disappoint this kid. Let's just send it to the president. So they sent it on to the president. The yeah. president secretary brought it in. She kind of chuckled and gave it to him. He opened it up and he read it. He was kind of touched and moved, you know, that this young child was really willing to reach out to God to find his help. And he said, look, he said, Write, write him a check for 10 bucks and send it, send it back to the kid. Who is. <laughs> Just assuming, you know, because he was a young boy that he would think $10 was a lot of money. So the boy gets the letter back from the post office, opens it up. It's a $10 check in. He's so excited, so, so proud of the fact that he got an answer to his prayer that he wrote a letter back to God and he said, God, said, thank you for sending the money. But apparently you had to send it through Washington and those jerks kept 90%. <laughs> 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 oh. We're not quite at that place with the government. You know, they're not getting 90% yet, so we still love them. We're correct for our government. But, uh, so anyway, turn with me to Bible Acts chapter Chapter 5, that joke has nothing to do with my sermon. I, I've been reading the book, How to Preach Without Notes, which explains why I'm down to just four pages today. <laughs> uh, I read this book, and, and you know, I kind of finished what I had to read this week. How to Preach Without Notes. Well, the first several chapters were about homiletics and hermeneutics and how to organize, how to outline all of the different formats and just really got, you would not believe how much, how many grammatical things there are involved in preparing sermons if you really want to get technical. And so I read all this, some of it I'm familiar with, other things I thought, well, that's good, I'll believe from that. But I really want to get to the part where you learn to preach without notes, right? And does anybody know, everybody tells me when I chase rabbits that uh, they like that. People say, oh, they like, what that means is I'm preaching without notes. And so, I got to, I finally got to the section in the book that said, how to preach without notes. I, you are not going to believe, I, I, I began to read, and this guy goes into explaining how to fold your paper and how to minimize your notes <clears throat> and fold your paper in such a manner that it fits in your Bible that nobody knows you have notes. <laughs> I read a book to get that information. <clears throat> But again, that has nothing to do with what I'm about to preach. Did so, it work? what I want to. <clears throat> What's that, brother? Did it work? You're fixing to find out. <laughs> <laughs> the answer is no. Let me these notes. Yeah, oh, yeah, I was also asked to announce a men of vision this tomorrow night. If you're a man over the age of five, you're invited. It's going to be at our house this, this month. Yes. Yes. Or in our house. If you need directions, let me know. And uh, so I will actually be teaching that lesson for what I understand. I'm going through the book of Matthew together. Just a bunch of men have a great time. We've been doing it for about 10 years. If you're a man, you should be involved in this if you're scheduled. That's we'll allow you to do that. So Acts chapter 5, verse 29 says this. But Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than man. Everybody say that part with me. We ought to obey God rather than man. Than man. So let me ask you a question this morning before we jump off into this, before we pray. What ought you to do? <clears throat> As a believer, <clears throat> what ought you to do? 
Okay. Well, this is what we're going to be looking at today is what we ought to do as Christians. So let's have, let's have a word of prayer. Father, <coughs> Lord, as I uh, come to you, Lord, just presenting myself to you, God, because I belong to you. Whether I preach from notes or whether I preach, uh, Lord, just from, from, free, from the free spirit, God, is not really the issue. The issue is that you say what you have on your heart for the people of New Life Church yeah. and for those that are visiting with us today. And so, God, I ask you to help me to be concise and to the point, but, Lord, to be led by the Holy Spirit in everything that I say and I do. Pray that you would give us all ears to hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Well, we want to learn today what it is that we ought to do. And that's what we want to hear from you. And so I thank you for speaking to us in advance, I think. Amen. We are living in a time, and I say this often, I guess because it's so impressed upon me, but we're living in a day and an age of great perplexity. You know, Jesus said in Matthew, I think it's Matthew chapter 24, when he's talking about the last days, he said there will be times of great perplexity, upheaval of all kinds. There will be, and he names all the different things that will be taking place at that time. But the word perplexity basically means confusion. You could say it means loss of way and direction. It's loss of assurity and stability in a person's thought. And Jesus said in the final days, in the last days, men will be perplexed. And so what I want to share with you today, where I want to go with this today, is to say to you that we are, I believe, in that day. A time of perplexity. I believe, believe the perplexity, though, has moved not only from the world, but it's moved into the church. It, it amazes me at how unstable in our thinking most Christians are. When we sit together and we have Bible studies together, not just New Life Church, but friends of mine, people that I know, uh, and, I, and I know this goes on at large across, at least across the nation, because we've lived all over the country growing up. I lived in a lot of places. And what I'm seeing, and I've seen it develop more and more and more, it's unfolding. Perplexity and confusion is unfolding in the church. What I mean by that is this. It used to be that when you were a part of a, a local church and community, you attended that church for the majority of your life. And so you learned a doctrinal statement of faith at whatever group you were with, and you knew what you believed, and you stood for what you believed. Now, we all know that there's human error in anything that humans get involved in, right? And so with each one of the denominations, I'm sure there were some things that were wrong and some things that were not so, so, so directly uh, truly doctrinal or scriptural. But overall, we understood the deity of Christ, the power of God to save the lost, and that we were going to live an eternal life with Christ, with God in heaven. And if there was and is an eternal fire of damn, damn, damnation for those who don't follow Christ. And that was understood. And you could go to just about any Christian church in the States and you'd be taught that and it, it, there may be some little different flavor of methodology and how you got involved in, in the church and how you connected with Christ. But basically that doctrine was understood, the deity of Christ. Today there's perplexity and confusion in the church. You don't have to go from church to church anymore to get a different understanding of what possibilities there are in doctrine. Now you just go to any church and sit down with a group and start talking doctrine and watch how many opinions and points and thoughts and differences there are in that little circle. It amazes me. Maybe some of it has to do with the fact that we are, we are pulling away from the denominational thing and the structure of denominations is disintegrating and you see more and more independent non-denominational churches rising. So there's less of a foundation for truth if you want to look at it that way. 
which almost sounds like an indictment against this church, but it's not. We have a statement of faith. We have a doctrinal statement that we go by and that we believe. If you don't know what that is, you need to get it and read it and find out if you belong to New Life Church. Because we believe what we believe, and we believe we believe the common things. Let me just go ahead and throw this out in case you because I brought that up and need to go there. Okay? We believe in the Trinity, that God is one in three persons. We believe in the deity of Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ was born of a virgin. Yeah. Yeah. Had no earthly father. Yeah. Grew up and lived a sinless life to the moment that he died. Yeah. Yeah. We believe that. We believe that Jesus is the only begotten Son of God. Yeah. We believe that God the Father, known as Jehovah in the Old Testament, Yahweh, mm -hmm. Yeshua, yeah. uh, would be Jesus' Hebrew name. We believe that they are the only true God. And there are, oh, there is only one way to the Father, and that yes. is through Jesus Christ. There are no other ways. Yeah. 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 We believe in the deity of Christ. We believe in the Trinity. We believe in the infallibility of the Word of God. That every jot and tittle is absolutely true. And if it seems to contradict itself, it's because we are human and cannot understand it. Yeah. It, we believe what Paul said in Corinthians, that the natural mind does not understand the things of God. They're spiritually discerned. They're spiritually appraised, another translation says. That, that you cannot, and I cannot, by my natural mind, open the Bible up and, and become a, a, a Bible scholar in its true sense by just reading and studying the Scripture and what other people said about it. We can only become Bible scholars when the Holy Spirit unveils to us what the truth is hidden behind the Word. Right. That it's a God thing. These are the things that we believe. We believe in the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We believe that when God, when Jesus said, if I don't go away, the Comforter cannot come. Therefore, I'm going to send him. And when he comes, he's going to guide you into all truth. So get ready. And then in Acts chapter 2, he came. Amen. He descended upon the people with tongues of fire. The, the, the fire that, that resonated over the entire room broke into tongues of fire and came down into each individual. And the Bible says there were more than 120, not 120 like you've been taught all your life. There, was a, there were more than 120. And the and those tongues of fire came down. And it said, and they all spoke with other tongues. And they all prophesied. And later on in that ch chapter, Peter said, this is that which the prophet Joel said was going to come in the last days. Your young men will see vision. Your old men will drink dreams. Uh, your, uh, your handmaidens will prophesy. And he went on down later in the chapter. He's still preaching. He said, and this gift, talking about the gift of the Father, you can study it out. It's called the gift of the Father, the baptism of the Holy Ghost. He said, and this gift is for you and your children and their children and as many as are afar off. That did not mean that it stopped with the apostles. It meant that it carried on to you and I. And you yeah. and your children ought to be prophesying and speaking in tongues. That's what Peter said. That's what Peter said. But we have scholarly men who found ways to reason away the truths of the Scripture and try to say those things passed away with the apostles. They said they were only 12 apostles, but they didn't read their Bible because in the Bible there are more than 12 apostles. And I'm sitting here looking at a spirit-filled church and you're looking at me like a calf looking at a new gate because you don't even know these things. <laughs> Did you know there's more than 12 apostles in the Bible? Yep. Did you know that? Yep. Did you know that there are apostles today? Yep. And I'm not one that's going to say I am. <laughs> I'm not even going to say I'm a prophet. I could probably get a raise or wow some of you if I said I was. I'm not going there. But I'm going to say to you, there are apostles and prophets and evangelists and pastors and teachers who are equipping the church today. Yep. And we know that's a fact because it says they're going to be until we come to the fullness of the stature of Christ to the measure of what He is. And we're not there yet. So he says, we, for God has given some to be apostles, some prophets, some pastors, some teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, until we come to the fullness of the stature of Christ. How many of you are as, as mature as Christ is? None of us are, and the church is not, and that's not going to happen until he comes back to get us. Mom. First Corinthians says, now these abide, faith, hope, and love. You go back and you look at it and what he's talking about, the context, chapter 13, he talks about love. We all know the love chapter. But right after that, he says, these, these, uh, 
Uh, he said, for now, we, we see through a glass dimly. I'm getting, my, I'm getting the order of my chapter out here. Now we see through a glass dimly, then we shall see face to face. Now we know in part, then we shall, then we shall know fully. Uh, when we see him, we shall be like him, John says. And you go back up in Corinthians chapter 13, and you're going to see where he talks about, he says, for now we, we know in part, we prophesy in part. But then those things will be fulfilled. Now we see darkly. And the, and the point is this. He said, when that which is perfect is come, that which is in part will be done away with. Yes. Talking about prophecy and supernatural knowledge, words of knowledge, and things of that, of that nature. He says, when that which is perfect is come, that which is a part will be done away with. So what the, what the uh, mainline church has done is they've said the word perfect there is teleos in the Greek. Me, and if you look up the word tell you, if you get your strongest concordance out and you look up the word perfect, when that which is perfect is come, that which is in part shall be done away with. And it's talking about the gifts of the Spirit right there that he just talked about in chapter 12. Am I confusing everybody? Because I'm kind of jumping around here. I didn't mean to do that. Okay. First Corinthians chapter 12. See, I'm preaching without notice. <laughs> this is not a part of what I was going to say. First Corinthians chapter 12. I guess the book helped, right? Okay, never mind. First Corinthians chapter 12 is about the gifts of the Spirit, the nine gifts of the Spirit, tongues, prophecy, uh, interpretation of tongues, gifts of healings, discernment, words of knowledge, words of wisdom, faith, supernatural faith, not just your common faith, and, and all these nine gifts. He goes into 13, chapter 13, he says, okay, so if you do all that, you have all that, in the church, he was talking to the believers in Corinthians, not to the 12 apostles, who the, the mainline church today wants to say just the 12 apostles had those gifts. He was talking to the church, 150,000 of them in Corinth. And he said, if you do all that, as a matter of fact, he said at the beginning of the whole book of Corinthians, you come behind and you fall behind in no gift. You got all this stuff going on in your church. And so here in chapter, chapter 13, he says, now, if you do all this stuff, but you don't have love, you're a clanging cymbal and a crashing donut. It's like somebody holding a pan up next to your head and beating it with a wooden spoon when they're operating against the Spirit if they're not doing that love. Come on. From there he goes and he says, love is. And he tells us what love is, right? He comes out of love, what love is. And then he says, now we prophesy in part. Now we have knowledge and, and, uh, and these things. And he says, but when that which is perfect has come, those things, the gifts in chapter 12, are going to be done away with. Now we see through glass dimly. Then we shall see face to face. Now we know in part, then we shall know in full. And so this point is this. We need prophecy in the church. We need messages in tongues with interpretation. We need discernment by the Spirit to know what's God and what's not God. We need gifts of healing in the church so that the sick can be made whole and well. The emotionally broken and unstable can be stabilized and re and reestablished re in their life. We need these things in the church. And so right now, we don't know. We don't get everything. So we, whatever God downloads, we just operate in that. And sometimes we get a little goofy with it, right? Sometimes we get off base and then people start to criticize and say, look at all those fruitcakes over there and how they act. And sometimes that's true. We're, we can look like fruitcakes and be, and be fruitcakes. But we need to have those gifts. They need to be ordered in the church and there needs to be structure and order around those. It doesn't need to be chaotic and crazy and everybody does what they want to do when they want to do it all in the name of the Lord. That's not God. God doesn't do that. Go to heaven and see how orderly things are. You don't need to stand up when you want to <laughs> in heaven. You do what you're told. That sounds like, ooh, I want to go there. Yeah, you do. You go to heaven. <laughs> Just do what? Think of the alternative. <laughs> you run the whole time. Yeah. Uh. <laughs> so. Running from the devil. How in the world am I going to get back to my son? I'm not close to him. Like So. So. Now we need those things in the church. 
because we see through a glass dimly. But then, when we see Jesus, it's going to all make sense. We're going to know as we're known. Not, and there's not going to be all these great mysteries to us. And, and, and God's going to say, bing, and our eyes are going to open, and we're going to be like, whoa, was I that wrong? Amen. And there's going to be a few things we're going to say, whoa, Lord, you really did show me that. And that'll be good. But in the meantime, we need these things in the church. So, what's, I'm going to try to turn this back toward my message. So, there is in the church today perplexity. People confused. People who don't know what they believe or why they believe it, but they believe. So, now I have to get to my notes so I can give you some statistics. All right? Didn't never mind. So, hang on. Okay. Stats on Christian ignorance. You ready for this? Researchers George Gallup and Jim Costello put the problem square. They said Americans revere the Bible, but by and large, they don't read it. And because they don't read it, they become a nation of biblical illiterates. Mm. How bad is it? Researchers tell us it's, the, it's worse than most can imagine. Fewer than half of all adults can name the four Gospels. What? Fewer than half of adults can name the four Gospels. Oh, Many Christians cannot identify more than two or three of the disciples. I'm not going to put you to the test this morning. Only 40% of believers said they believe in the infallibility of the Scripture, which means that the Bible is absolutely 100% accurate. 40% don't believe that. 30 plus percent believe that there's more than one way to get to God. In the Christian church, According to data from Barna Research Group, 60% of Americans can name five of the Ten Commandments only. No wonder people break the Ten Commandments all the time. They don't know what they are, said George Barna, president of the firm. Multiple surveys reveal the problem in stark terms. According to 82% of Americans, God helps those who help themselves. <laughs> it is a Bible verse. <laughs> I bet there's somebody in here who believes that. If you believe that, right now, don't you? <laughs> those, who, those identifying themselves as born-again Christians did a little better on that stat, 1% better. Mm -hmm. Some of the statistics, statistics are enough to perplex even those aware of the problem. One poll indicated that at least 12% of adults believe that Joan of Arc was Noah's Ark's wife. <laughs> 12% of adults. Another survey, survey of graduating high school seniors revealed that over 50% of graduating high school students thought that Sodom and Gomorrah were husband and wife. A considerable number indicated that the Sermon on the Mount was preached by Billy Graham. If we don't know what the Bible teaches, how are we supposed to discern what, we're, what we ought to be doing? Yep. And what we ought not to be doing. How are we supposed to do that? So I want to show you, beginning today, because I don't think I'm going to get through this today. But I want to show you, verbatim, what you ought to do. What you, as a believer, ought to do. If you're a Christian, raise your hand. I don't see any Christians we have. And, and say this with me. I want to learn, I want to learn. what I ought. What I ought to do. To do. You know, that word ought is a funny word. If, if you, you, do you ever think about word structure? Anybody do that? We've got school teachers around here. Do you ever think about ought? Everybody say ought. Ought. Isn't that a weird word? Yeah. Well, in the Bible, the Greek word for ought can actually be translated two ways. There's two different, two different uh, <laughs> meanings, both of which we're going to be looking at. And what I've done is I just I just uh, went to my concordance and I searched the, the words ought to. The Bible is interesting. There are so many. There's an unfathomable, unending manner of ways that the Scripture, in the Scripture that God has put messages in the Bible to convey those to us. 
I mean, there's no end to the ways God has done this. I, I can, let me just throw some things at you. There are hidden messages about God in the names of people. Mm -hmm. right. There are hidden messages in the way the chapters are broken down. And the chapters were broken down years after the Bible was written. There are hidden messages in word studies. You can take any number of individual words and study that word. And that word, when you look at it throughout the scripture, will begin to reveal a deeper truth. There are, I mean, it's just on and on and on and on and on and on it goes. There are phrases like first day, second day, the third day, the fourth day. Take one of those phrases and study it out and see what all you begin to learn. And, 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 and a particular truth will arise and it won't confuse you throughout the Bible. It will arise from the beginning and it will carry throughout the rest of the Bible. There's a principle I've told you before. It's called the principle of the law of first mention. The first time something is mentioned in the Bible, there's a precedent set, and you'll find a truth that will carry out throughout the rest of the Bible. It is amazing how that works. The Bible says that he reveals the end from the beginning. That's right. Did you know that you can go to the first five books of the Bible, the Pentateuch, study the five books of the Bible, first five books of the Bible, and every doctrinal truth in the scripture is in those first five books. Right. If it's all right there, it reveals the end from the beginning. Did you know that you can study the, the book, the first chapter of Genesis? And when you look at it from the right perspective and you dig it out, you'll find out that there's much of the end. Revelations revealed in Genesis chapter 1. Yes, it is. I mean, I could go on and on. Did you know? I said I was good, but I'm going to. Did you know that there are 365 prophecies in the Old Testament that the Messiah would have to fulfill to prove that he was the Messiah? And Jesus fulfilled every one, one for every day of the week. Did you know there's 31 chapters in the book of Proverbs? One chapter for you to read a day is the book of wisdom. And if you would read one chapter a day, you'd finish that book in a month, and you'd finish it the next month, and you'd finish it the next month. And if you had the wisdom of the book of Proverbs, you would be doing that. I did it for years. And you'll get all these wisdom principles from reading the book of Proverbs. Man, you could go on and on and on and on. But I can't. Because I need to move on. But listen. The Bible is God's expression of Himself to us. And so, if we don't read the Bible, how can we possibly know what God wants from our lives? How can we know what we ought to do? So I went and I just looked up the words <laughs> ought to. And you won't believe how many times the Bible says you ought to do something. So let me just give you two definitions that I found. Yeah, I can look this up. One of the definitions of the word ought means must needs be. Or is necessary or it behooves us. That is the definition of the word ought that is in the text that I gave you, which reads this way. But Peter and the other apostles answered and said, we ought to obey God rather than man. Would you agree with that? Yeah. You ought to obey God rather than man. Even if man puts your head on the guillotine, you ought to obey God rather than man. As a matter of fact, I hope for the guillotine one day. Because the way things are going, if the Muslims take over, it's likely to be a hacksaw. Come on. Damn. Damn. I should have said that. Let's move on. <laughs> that don't put the fear of God in it. It'll make you mad. So whichever you can do that. Uh, anyway, so listen. Listen. It, it behooves me. In other words, listen. I wasn't put in the context of the scripture. But Peter and the other apostles answered and said, we ought to. Or we must needs to obey God. We 
find it necessary to obey God. It behooves us to obey God. The other definition that we're going to find as we look up the word ought and look at some scriptures is we're going to find this other one. It's uh, it's it's the Greek word of faith, of faith, as in accruing debt, a thing owed, or something in debt. Hmm. I'll go ahead and throw the scripture at you just get it. Husbands all, therefore, husbands all to love their wives. That's the scripture. And it is this Greek word here, which means as in accruing debt, a thing owed to be indebted to. Husbands, you are indebted to love your wife. You're not asked to love your wife. You are, you are committed to that. It's an investment that you're making when you love your wife. And we'll come back to that as we get a little further along. But I just want to get those out. So before I do this, and again, I, I'm obviously not going to get through all of these. I have eight of them, and they break down several times. So I'll, I'll probably finish this up in the weeks to come. On the week to come. But I felt it like necessary to, as a prerequisite, to tell you what we ought to do. As a prerequisite to what we ought to do, I'm going to show you what God says about how to do what we ought to do. So I'm going to tell you four verses of Scripture here about how to do what we ought to do when we get to what we ought to do. Is everybody with me? Yeah. This is a little different than the way I normally present that. So last week was pretty intense. This week's not. So <laughs> Colossians chapter 3, verse 17 says this. And whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord. Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. Okay? And whatever you do, because we're going to look here in a moment, we're going to start looking at what we ought to do. So when we get to what we ought to do, He's going to say to us right here, whatever you do, when you do what you ought to do, do it in the name of the Lord. Now, here's the significance there. How many of you know, if you're doing something and you're doing it in God's name, you really need to do it well. Because God is going to get the blame for what we do. Or the praise for what we do. So whatever you do, in word or deed, when you say something or when you do something, do it in the name of the Lord and do it with giving thanks. Ecclesiastes 9.10 says, whatever your hand finds to do, do it with your mind. For there is no work or device or knowledge or wisdom in the grave where you're going. I think this is really cool. Whatever you do, do it with all your mind. What does the Bible say about loving God? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Don't just love God a little bit. Love God with everything in you. Amen. Whatever you do, though, Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might. Don't sit down for a smoke break when your boss walks around the corner. <laughs> oh, damn. No, we don't have smokers in here, so don't have to worry about that. Don't stop. Do it with all your might. Number three, 1 Corinthians 10, 31. Therefore, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Okay, do it in the name of the Lord, do it with all your might, and do it to the glory of God. I preached a series a while back talking about, about us living to, to, for the glory of God. And what that means is to, 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 for us to do something for the glory of God is to make God look great. Come on. That's what it means. Our lives should be making God look great to the world around us. And yet so often the church has made God look pitiful to the world around us. We would be winning how many more souls if somebody would just throw the church in the ocean somewhere. Preacher didn't say that, did he? Y'all get what I mean? Hypocrisy. Hypocrisy. But there's a true church inside that church that is the real church that are living for God. And our job is to make God look good. To outshine all the hypocrisy. You know, when people say to me, well, preacher, you know, I'd come to church if it weren't for all the hypocrites in there. And, uh, you know, I just tell them, hey, you know. Don't want to have to. Yeah, we are there because we need the Lord. It's the best it's Lord. Lord. But anyway, last thing. Last thing, prerequisite to what we ought to do is this. 
Colossians 3.23. And whatever you do, do it heartily. Put your heart into it. As to the Lord and not to men, put your heart in whatever you do. Don't just do it. Don't, don't just don't come in here and just clap because we're clapping. We're singing. Don't just raise your hands. God. Freak, uh, worship leader says time to raise your hands. Put your heart into what you do. Whatever you do. When you go to work and you feel like you got slighted because you didn't get the promotion that this guy got and you know he works a lot harder than you do, you should continue to put your heart into what you're doing because promotion is of the Lord. And God will see you and God will promote you in his new season, in his time. But do whatever you do and do it from your heart. And, and I just made this little notation here. Knowing that God is the one who matters and who will have the final say in all things. He can make you stand or fall. He can make you prosper. Okay, so. My note says, this is why I don't use notes anymore. 13 things you ought to do. Now, you'll be glad to know that by the time I refined these notes and forgot to change that, it's down to eight. Now, the 13 were originally 17, and I moved them to 13 and changed that, and then I refined it down to eight, so you're really going to get 17 things that you ought to do, which I can't get through today. So let me see where I am on the schedule here. Oh, God says go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> so turn with me in your Bibles to Psalms chapter 76 and 11. I want you to follow along in your Bibles. I'd like you to circle the word ought to, the words ought to so that you can always go back and see what you ought to do. As a matter of fact, I would make a chain in my Bible if I were you to do this today. A chain is where you circle ought to, and the next verse I tell you, you write it next to that. And the next, and the time that you go back and you read this, and you say, what was another verse he said? It'll be written right there. And you go to that one, and then you write the next one, and you go to that one, and you'll have a chain in your Bible on the words what you ought to do. So the first thing that I got in, in my order here, uh, the way I've ordered this, that we ought to be doing is we ought to fear God. Who in here fears the Lord? If you raise your hand or if you are one who fears the Lord, you are already on track to be a wise person. The Bible says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. That's where wisdom starts. If you don't fear God, nothing else you do is going to be right. Because you're going to be making decisions from your carnal nature, from the lust of your heart, from your eyes, your flesh, from what you want, and those decisions are going to go bad in time. But if you fear God, then you go to God and say, Lord, what do you want for my life? Well, the Bible says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. You go to God and say, God, look, I reverence you. I know that you know what's best and what's right for me. If you go to Him, then that fear will position you for Him to be able to speak in your life and you'll start making the right choices and right decisions. The speaker at the Zion Academy graduation yesterday, he, he wound up with two, two words of advice. He used uh, he used illustrations and all kind of things. He did a great job. Uh, it's actually Pastor Todd from Murray, Murray Hills Church of Christ who was in our wrestling match. We, if you weren't here, we had a wrestling ring in here a couple weeks ago and <laughs> fundraising for missions, wrestling for missions. And Todd was actually here. Todd was the speaker there. And he spoke. And, and his final two points were, were this. One of them was make wise choices. Make wise choices. He could possibly have worded that a little differently and said, fear the Lord. Because if you fear the Lord, you're going to make wise choices. The first thing that we ought to do, Psalm 76, verse 11. says, make vows to the Lord your God and pay them. Let all who are around him bring presents to him who ought to be feared. Do you see that? That it says that we, that the Lord ought to be feared. Everybody say this with me. God, God ought to be feared. Ought would you agree feared. with me that the world would be a better place if everybody feared God? Yes. How many of you think you would feel a little safer at night? Yes. When you had to go downtown Nashville and you were walking that back alley to get to that bank that you didn't really want to go to to begin with and, and you see all these people standing around <laughs> Looking at you like they did. You would be wishing that everybody feared the Lord. 
Because things change when people fear God. And so the psalmist said, make vows to the Lord your God and pay me. And let all who are around him bring presents to him who all to be feared. Now the reference here of bringing presents, bringing gifts to him is important. But first he said this. I thought this was interesting. He said, let all who are around him. Are you around God? I thought that was kind of cool, Sam. Are you around God? Well, we know God's around you and around me. The Bible says, you know, if I stand in the heights of heaven, he's there. If I go to the depths of hell, he's there. Where can I go that thou art not? It, nowhere. He's around me. But am I around him? See, me being around him is a choice that I make. It's a matter of the mind. It's a matter of accepting the fact that I'm around him. Uh, as one writer wrote a, wrote a classic Christian book called Practicing His Presence. Yes. Yes. Practicing the presence of God. Are you constantly making yourself aware that God is with you? Are you around him? And those who are around him, he said, let them bring him gifts. Let them make vows and pay them and let them bring him gifts. So the significance in that is that was a that was protocol in the day uh, for kings. If you were to go, had to go see the king for whatever the reason, you needed you needed help and you needed his judgment, his direction, or his approval, or his his stamp, or what have you. When you go before the king, you 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 would bring a gift. And the bigger, the more elaborate the gift, obviously, the more attention you're going to get the king. From the kingdom. And so scripture is saying here, bouncing off of that thought, that we ought to fear God like they feared the king. You know, the English have it well when they say, fear God, fear the king. And we need to understand that in our, in our, in our society, because of democracy, we don't quite get that concept. We have respect for our president. We have respect for our our. our Authorities and our political leaders to a point. But what's missing is they don't bear the sword. Are you with me on that? You, you go talk to your congressman. If you don't like what he's saying, you say, look, buddy, this is what the people want. I'm speaking for the people. And you can get belligerent, get his face, and he might bark back at you. Y'all might actually have a round there, right there on public square. And then you shake hands and thank you, buddy, for listening to me. And everybody goes home happy. Well, listen, you didn't do that with the king. That's right, that's right. The king would look over at one of his subjects and he'd say, off with his head. You know, your head would roll. And so the writer of this psalm was comparing that. And he said, God ought to be feared. If you fear the king when you're around him, how much more should you fear God? You're around God. Who sets a man up, takes a man down. Who chooses your eternal destiny for you. How much more should we be fearing God? To fear Him means to show Him reverence. It's realizing the scale of His power and submitting to it out of legitimate fear. Now, I, I tell you, it kind of irks me. It gets under my skin when people preaching about the fear of God say, no, this doesn't mean you're supposed to be scared of God. It does mean that. Amen. You look the Greek word up. It means fear. Amen. Trembling. The trembling. That's yeah. exactly right. How many times in the Bible do we see where just angels appeared to people and they started to tremble and fall down? How much more? When we stand before the throne of God, are we going to be afraid? Amen. We need to fear God. We ought to fear God. Number two, we ought to follow protocol in the house of God. We ought to follow protocol in the house of God. When I first came to New Life Church, this was a good church. It had been a good church since it was since it began. But it had gotten a little off track, and there was a bunch of craziness going on. I mean, uh, it was a bunch of craziness going on. <laughs> a bunch of craziness going on. And to this day, I'm paying for that. To this day. 
people will bring it up when I tell them where I'm pastor. That's how bad it was. And so when I came in, the Lord told me that the house in order. Yes. So I preached six weeks from 2 Kings chapter 10 where Solomon set the house in order. And what the house of the Lord was supposed to be like. One lady who later quit the church and left, because she was kind of at that school, told me before she left, she said, you know, she said, the day you came here, the first sermon you preached, she said, my, my husband didn't come to church that day. She said, I went home and told him, we ain't in Kansas, Kansas no more. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And she was right. It ain't Kansas no more. But anyway, there ought to be order in the house of the Lord. You know, a lot of interesting things. I can take this from another one. The Bible calls the apostles, speaking of Peter, for instance, it says, who were, who were pillars in the church. Yes. You know what that means? Yes. Something strong, yes. stable, yes. held things together that you can't push down. The Bible says that God chose the apostles to lay the foundation of the church. It says that Christ is the cornerstone of that foundation. Listen, if you look at all these patterns and all these different pictures in the Scripture, you find out the church is supposed to be a thing of stability with order yep. and structure in it. Yes. Right. Now, inside yes. that, there are walls and perimeters of safety for people that inside of that, we ought to be able to run crazy and just dance and praise and shout and love and worship God without fear of what anybody else thinks. Did you get everything I just said? Yeah. Order brings safety. Yes. Yeah. Psychologists say if you take a child and put them on a, a, on a porch, a ledge, if you will, of a 20-story skyscraper with a rail around it, the average child will run to that rail and grab the, the bars and try to stick his head. But they say you remove the rail and he won't go out the door. Or if he does, he'll cling to the wall and stand because he's afraid because there's no barrier. There's no boundary. And so in the church, there should be boundaries. You should know. You should sense. When I go to church, pastor's not going to let anybody act a fool. Our elders are going to keep order in the house. You should be still safety in that. But you also ought to know that we have boundaries. And inside those boundaries, if somebody wants to go crazy, but they stay in the boundaries because they're so in love with Jesus, they can't contain it. And I may sit here like a prude, but if they can express their worship, that's their business as long as they're inside the boundary. Y'all, who all didn't understand that? You know what's so funny about talking to, to a group like this is every one of you just had a totally different understanding of what I said. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Somebody would think, ooh, I'm going to bring my dancing shoes next week. <laughs> Other people would think, I'm glad he shut them down. <laughs> so, uh, but, but there needs to be protocol in the house of the Lord. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 14 and 15 says, These things I write to you, though I hope to come to you shortly. But if I'm delayed, Paul said, I write so that you may know how you ought to conduct yourself in the house of God. There is a way, a protocol that should be followed in the house of the Lord. What is that protocol? Well, I'll tell you something. If you go to Nigeria and you worship there, the worship is going to be very different than it is here, right, brother? It's going to be a different world. And yet it is just as much in order there as it is when we have it in order. It's a difference in personality. It's a difference in culture. It's a difference in personal expression. It's a difference in the movement of the spirit. That, 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 you know what I'm saying? Wherever you go. So what are... How should we conduct ourselves in the house of the Lord? I'm going to answer that question for you. 49.95. <laughs> you should conduct yourself like your local church is leadership says it should be conducted. That's very simple. If I go to the Church of Christ, now, if I, I have visited Graymere Church. Okay? I visited there. I, I visited, Lord knows how many churches in this town because I like to go to church. I go on Sunday night sometimes. I go to think, well, whatever. 
I've been all over the place around here. And when I go to those churches, I don't necessarily do what I do here. Does that make me hypocritical because I don't do there what I do here? Some people visit a church that doesn't raise their hands, and they just think they got showed their spirituality. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. Glory. And everybody in there is thinking, so that black coat doing that? <laughs> and the usher will walk him out the back door, and he'll go home and say, bless God, those people weren't spiritual enough for me. Right? <laughs> no, he was wrong, and he should have been thrown out. Matter of fact, they should pick him up by the seat of his pants and throw him out. <laughs> because he's out of order. That's right. Come on. First Peter talks about submitting, therefore, to every ordinance of man. To the king who is supreme. To the governor. And it tells about authority. It says we're to submit to every ordinance of man. You look that word ordinance up in the Strong's Concordance and you'll find out it's not ordinance. It really should have been translated institution. Now what that means is if I go to, to a SciTech where Scott is a, a chemical engineer and they do and, and say I'm a chemical engineer and they hire me and I come to work at SciTech and Scott says, okay, we do things like this over here, we'll be doing that. And I say, no, 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 that's not how we do it. Scott says, no, that's how we do it at SciTech. And, and, and I said, no, 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 I've got a better idea. And even if I have a better idea, because where I came from, we had some hydraulic something or another making stuff like he does. Chemistry, he's a chemical engineer. And so I, I, we had developed something that they didn't know about because it was secret. And I kept saying, Scott, listen, man, we've got a secret that we have over there. I'm going to give you. And Scott says, I don't have an institute of secret. Guess what? I have to submit to that institution. To that directive, to that ordinance. So if I go to the Church of Christ and they teach and preach that that uh, that the pastor is not a called and anointed pastor, he's a minister. You go ask them. The pastors they have are two men that are elected into office to be the pastors. And the pastor's job, at a, the two pastor's jobs at a, at a Church of Christ, are to keep the minister in line. That's their job. And to be active as elders to the church. And so I go there and I say, that's clearly not biblical. At least from my perspective. Well, when I go to a Church of Christ and I sit down, I want to glean the truth that they have to offer. And I sit and I listen to the truth and I throw the bone bones out. And what the order of the house is, is what I'm going to submit to. I'm not going to stand up and say, what's that dude doing in the pulpit? He's not even the pastor. <laughs> there should be protocol in the church that we should know how we ought to conduct ourselves in the house of God. Let me give you some reasons, some ways to do that. Number one is showing love. When we're in the church, when we're in the body of Christ, whether it's inside these walls or all where so much for that change. We ought to show love. Would you agree with that? Yeah. Yes, you will. Yes, you do. I know you do. Listen to this. First John 4, 10 through 12. And this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us, and he sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us. We also, are you ready? Ought to love one another. Uh -huh. yeah. You know what? In the house of the Lord, part of the protocol is we need to love each other. If we just love each other, all this structure and all this order and all this who gets to do what, to be in what, all that stuff goes away. So nobody cares. It's just whoever needs to do it rises to the occasion. Let me tell you what happened. We had in the calendar fall out over here, fell out of a chair. A, a year and a half, two years ago. I uh, passed that. I don't even know what his problem was. Mini stroke or something of that nature. What happened was immediately Lee turned around over there and starts waving at everybody. <laughs> I'm picking on Lee. And uh, he was trying to get his wife's attention, who is a nurse, right? And so he gives her attention. She runs over there quickly, takes charge. Everybody else steps back. She's the man in charge. Why is that? It's called custom. It's called customs. It's a custom. It's one of the seven laws of authority. Custom. You submit to custom when custom is in authority. If they've been driving down a road, there's a car wreck, Bob flies through the windshield, lands in the street. Dr. Reed, Reed is driving by. He stops his car. He runs to the scene. 
the police officers will step back and let the doctor take charge. It's called custom. It's the person who has the authority and the ability and the knowledge and the education to deal with the situation at the moment. That's how the church ought to be operating. Customarily, things ought to just function. Now, unfortunately, because we get feelings and emotions, and I want to be big dog, or I don't want to do that, or what all these things go through us because we're human. What happens is we just don't function like we should function. So we have to come back and say, okay, we're going to lay some order because somebody's got to be in charge. So right now we have, we're, we're developing right now two teams. One of the teams is the medical emergency team. And Tamara, who is over there, is going to be one of the directors of that team. We have, I think, seven or eight nurses in our church when they're all here. We have two physicians. We've got right here in the house what's needed if somebody falls out from a heart attack. And the rest of us don't need to get in that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right? Amen. Okay, we're also developing a security team right now. It's going to be, I think, four men. They will be carrying weapons. Yeah. So if somebody goes to shoot the pastor, they'll shoot him. <laughs> uh, I've said eight times. At one point, I counted eight or nine people that were carrying in this church. And I said, good Lord, if anybody ever comes down that aisle and shoot me, I'm not worried about them. I'm worried about the rest of those people. <laughs> Listen, that's why we're organizing this. Listen, our insurance company told us to do this. They said, Listen, you need to know the culture you're living in today. You need a security team, and it needs to be in order. And we, the insurance company, we want to know about it so that if anything happens, we will cover the men who are carrying guns at your church to protect your church body. All right. Listen, that's where we live today. Y'all need to know this is not the world it was 10 or 15, 20 years ago. It's a different world. But we're, we're going to be moving into some things with, with what all is happening in our culture. We're going to be moving into some stuff that could get really ugly. And we need to be prepared for every bit of it. We're going to have a medical team in place. We're going to have a security team in place. All right? And so we ought to love one another. That's part of our protocol in the house. And actually serving one another. In word and deed, John chapter 3, verse 14 through 18. Give me just a couple more minutes. I'll, I'll shut this down. It says, we know that we pass from death to life because we love the brother. He who does not love his brother abides in death. Whoever hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. Everybody say amen to that. Amen. By this we know love, because he laid down his life for us. We also ought to, ought to lay down our lives for the brother. We need to be laying down our lives for one another. That, that doesn't mean we're not laying from the train. That means when somebody needs their furniture moved and they're in bind, that we bind together and we run over and we help them move that. Those are better. It means when somebody's sick, that we develop, we deliver meals to them, that we have people who visit them, we have people who pray for them. It, it means that we lay down our own agendas to help meet each other's agendas. These are things that we need to grow into more and more. We've done a lot of this over the years, but we need to grow into that. It needs to become more and more a part of who we are. Protocol in the house. We need to be speaking highly of the leadership and of one another. I thank God for this church that we we just don't have a lot of that. Haven't had a lot of that over the years. It's, it, it, you know, anywhere there are people, there are going to be some things that poke their head up occasionally. Uh, maybe it's because we we just don't talk. Come on. You know? You know, maybe that's it. Maybe that's it. Maybe, maybe it's just because we're big people. Come on. Or whatever the case. Second Thessalonians says this. Three seven. For you yourselves know how you ought to follow us. But we were not disorderly among you. Listen, if you've got leaders who love the Lord, you should follow them. You should follow them. Uh, Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. Is that not the most arrogant statement you ever heard in your life? No, absolutely not. He was saying, look, I'm following the Lord. Why would you not want to follow that? For he gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some pastors, some teachers for the work of the ministry. Until we all come to the fullness of the statue of Christ. We need to follow our leaders. <laughs> right? Yeah. You've got great elders here. You've got
got the Lord of Hosts goes to church here. Uh, <laughs> you're visiting, you totally need to get <laughs> Okay. We need to be speaking highly of our leaders and all that. We need to find our place in the house and serve the Lord with gladness. This is all still in the protocol of the church. Finding where you belong in the house and serving. Hebrews 5, 12 says this. For though by now, by this time, you ought to be teachers. But some of you need to learn the elementary principles of the scripture. So this is what he said. He said, you know what? By now, you ought to be teachers. This is something that belongs in the church. It's a part of protocol in the church. You finding what you are called to do, what you ought to be doing by now, if it's teaching, it's teaching, if it's prophesying, it's prophesying, if it's serving, it's serving, if it's if it's taking care of children, it's doing that, if it's, if it's greeting, if it's being a host in the house, whatever it is, a worship team member, if it's whatever it is that you're called to do, you find your place and you get in that and you function in that. That's part of the protocol in the house. It's everybody doing what they're called to do. And a big thing happens as a result of a lot of small people. Yeah. Last one on this. Well, we're doing our part in giving. Matthew 23, 23 says this. This is Jesus speaking. He said, What do you scribes and Pharisees? Hypocrites. For you pay tithe of men and anise and cumin, and have neglected the way your matters of the law, justice, fairness, and mercy. <laughs> justice, mercy, and faith. These you ought to have done without leaving the others undone. This is a very interesting scripture when you really break it down and get to look at it. It says a lot. There's a lot that can be done with it. Uh, there are denominations, Church of Christ being one, who teach that tithing is under the Old Testament law and it no longer exists. But we're not supposed to tithe. Okay, they say the reason is because the New Testament doesn't speak of the tithe. Well, they need to reread the New Testament. There are seven places in the New Testament that speak of tithe. Hebrews chapter 7, I think it is, has a lot to say about Melchizedek giving. It goes on and shows that we're supposed to give, we're supposed to tithe, as Abraham tithed to Melchizedek. But here Jesus is speaking. He's speaking to the Pharisees. He's speaking to people who are still under the law. He's not speaking to the church necessarily. But he says this. He says, you guys are hypocrites. He said, you tithe the minutest things. You have a little garden out back. Out uh, back of your house, a lot of us are planting gardens right now. And in that garden, you're growing these little herbs, anise and cumin. And, and, and they, they grow up, they're little bitty plants. And you're very careful to pick off 10% of that plant. And you're bringing it to the temple and you're laying it on the altar so everybody can see that you're tithing everything that comes into your hand. Come on. Now, how do you know the scriptures teach that we're supposed to tithe the first of all of our increase? That's right. That means, that means your anise and your cumin. Uh, it, it means that whatever you grow, if it's tomatoes, the pastor will take your 10%. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. If there's enough of you, I'll let Matthew have a little bit of it and say it. But other than that, it's yeah. <laughs> But anyway, so... <laughs> Biblically, yes, we're supposed to tithe our 10%, down to the minutest amount. And Jesus said, you tithe all these little bitty things, but you neglect the most important stuff, justice, mercy, fairness, the things that are about how you treat people. Come on. You're missing the point. God doesn't want your herb if your heart is wrong. Right? Right. And he didn't stop there. He went on and he said this. You ought to have done this. Did y'all get that? Yeah. But not neglected the things that really matter. To me, that's about as clear as it gets on time. We, we want to, again, like I said, we're so biblically illiterate as a whole. But we want to argue everything. Absolutely. We're so immature that we ask questions like, what do I have to tie them gross? <laughs> well, I don't know. <laughs> Why do you ask? Because you're the pastor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Does not your heart tell you that? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> I remember when I was a teenager. I was a Christian. I loved the Lord. I was trying to serve God. Keep my hands to myself, being my best friend. He had a girlfriend. He was trying to keep his hands to himself. 
<laughs> he called me up one night. He said, I'm having a terrible time. He said, you know, we're parking. We listen to music. He said, I just, I, you know, where is the line? How far is too far? <laughs> I didn't want to answer him because I was the same age. <laughs> <laughs> how far is too how far is too far? Well that's real easy. Why did you not ask that is it too far for me to get in the car with her? Oh, uh, why didn't you ask, is it too far for me to date? Why didn't you ask, is it too what why didn't you ask those questions? Because they're not too far. Come on. It's too far when you ask, is it too far? Come on. Come on now. <laughs> Am I telling the truth or what? Yes. None of us want to hear that because there's all kinds of things we're going too far on. <laughs> okay. You know what? We may have some illiteracy in the church. We don't have an illiterate spirit living within us. Come on. You see, the Spirit of God that dwells within us, First John says, teaches us all things and we have need that no man should teach us. Now that doesn't mean you don't need teachers. Don't take that run crazy. You've got to go back in the context. Context is about the Antichrist coming. And he is the spirit of Antichrist in the world. And, 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 and that's what it's talking about. And it says, but we, you have no need that any man should teach you. There's anointing that abides in you. You have no need that any man should teach you. That's what it says. Talking about the Antichrist. I'll tell you something. You don't have to worry about falling prey to the spirit of Antichrist as it begins to envelop the world, which it's already doing. You will yeah. know in your spirit what's a God and what's not. No, that's what you tell you. You don't need a church. You don't need a pastor. You, you don't really have to have the Bible for that. There is an anointing that abides within you that will clash with that spirit and say, Hey, God! Come on. And you'll know that. Amen. So everything else, we need teachers. We need help. We need to encourage one another. And, and what we need is to learn that there are things that we ought to do. I, the, book I, the book that I told you I was reading about preaching without notes. I've, I've gone a long time today. That's what happens when you don't use notes in life. <laughs> he gives seven things. And I may talk about these Wednesday night. I'm kind of thinking uh -oh. Seven ways to motivate people when you're preaching. Seven appeals, he calls them. And... And those appeals are each one is entirely different. One of them is the obligation appeal. I'm not sure how he terms it, but it may, it basically means you put it out in front of the people that they ought to do something. And that so fits with this. Our culture does not like that appeal anymore. I was listening to Christian radio this week, and you had know, 91.7, and there was a show on. It was a group of ladies, young ladies, I would say, I would dare say they were in their 20s, and they loved the Lord, and there were three or four of them, and they were discussing some particular family issue kind of thing. And one of them would say, well, you know, I believe that, uh, uh, you know, that she said, well, you know, this is what's happening in culture, and uh and, and the Bible says so and so, and the other one would say, "Yes." Now that raises more interesting questions. And she would ask a question, and the next one asked a question to the question, and the other one asked a question. To, I'm not kidding. All I, I sat there and listened for 20 or 30 minutes, and all I heard were questions about questions about questions and about questions and about questions about questions about the question and the question about the other question. Nobody said anything. I'm not trying to be funny right now. I'm trying to, this, is, this is an important point. Nobody said, thus saith the Lord. And when, they, when that radio program, I thought, you are burning up Christian radio time. But that is the culture that we live in where nobody has a right to tell me what I ought to do. Am I telling the truth? Yeah. Amen. Now you can throw all these ideas out. And I can question that. Well, that brings to mind another thought. <laughs> That's all they did. They just chased thoughts and possibilities and questions. And nobody said, thus saith the Lord. Yeah. 
This thing has a little weird, little weird for me. Yeah. We're slipping away. We are. Slipping away. When you hear or read, it does say the Lord, you then become accountable to Amen. And God will hold us accountable. Amen. 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 Right. Amen. 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 Amen.